camel for a farthing. Once upon a time in Persia, there lived a merchant who suffered huge business losses and became extremely poor. One day, on their way to the market, the merchant and his son saw a man selling the camel. The merchant's son went up to the camel dealer and asked the price of the camel. The dealer told him that the price of the camel was a farthing, a monetary unit in olden times. The son went and told his father who said that the price of the camel was too high. Time passed and the merchant again became successful. He was now very rich. Travelling again with his son, he came to a village where an egg was on sale for a farthing. The merchant's son went to his father and told him the price. This time, the merchant said that it was very cheap. The changed opinion of the merchant was not due to his knowledge of price, but because of his changed circumstances. Paradise on Earth One of Abdullah's camels was lost. He set off to look for it across the desert. A long, tiring ride over the sands brought him to a strange sight. High walls rose around the city and rooftops and pavilions could be seen over them. Hoping to find someone in the city, surrounded with fort-like walls, Abdullah tied his camels outside and walked into the city. Perhaps someone will be able to tell me about my lost camel, he thought. But entering the city, he stopped, amazed. It was built of gold and silver bricks, decorated with rubies and other precious stones. The floors of the large rooms were covered with pearls and under the streets, lined with fruit-laden trees, ran clear streams. The city was fragrant with musk and saffron. But there was not a single living creature there. Abdullah collected some gold bricks, jewels and musk so that people might believe him and rode back. The Caliph and the Wise Man When Abdullah returned to his own town, he told everyone what he had seen. His story came to the ears of the Caliph. The Caliph sent his minister to talk to Abdullah. He came back and said that Abdullah had proof of the city with him as he had brought the bricks and the jewels. The Caliph wondered what this city was and called the wise man to ask for his opinion. The wise man said, I have heard ancient stories that this city was built by Shaddad, a great king, who read many books and wanted to build a paradise on earth as magnificent as the one in heaven. He had hundreds of kings, chieftains, soldiers and ministers. He called all of them and sent them across the world to fetch everything splendid and rare to build this paradise. While ships and caravans went out to fetch things, he sent workmen to build a great fortress with a thousand pavilions on it. Shaddad's Caravan it took 20 years for the entire fort and the city of Edom to be built with materials collected from everywhere. Shaddad was also busy getting together his court along with all the ladies and attendants so that he might shift all the people to his new city. He led the way with his troops while everyone else followed in the heavily laden caravan. They travelled for many days. In the caravan, there were many people who did not believe that there was a paradise in heaven. This made God very angry with Shaddad and his people. So when they were about to reach the new city, after one more day, God's anger fell on them. Suddenly from the skies, a loud cry was heard and it destroyed everyone and everything in the caravan. No one reached the city of Edom which lay silent and deserted since then. Shaddad's Tomb When Shaddad left for Eram with his court, he made his son, who was called Shaddad the Younger, the king at his old kingdom. For a long time, there was no news of his father. Then some travellers, who saw the destruction, carried the message to Shaddad the younger. 
he went to the place with his troops and mourned for the death of his father and his people. Then he found a great cavern in which he built a magnificent tomb for Shaddad the Greater. He made a golden bed to lay him and covered him with silken robes and decorated the place with gold and jewels. He wrote an inscription there to guide people that no matter how great a king was, he must follow the right way, the way to God, or he would be destroyed. Now there is no road to Iran. Only some travelers like Abdullah had seen it. The Tomb of Nasharwan Nasharwan had been one of the wisest and the most famous kings of Persia. His tomb was a place of pilgrimage because it gave the pilgrim great lessons in how to live a good and just life. Caliph Harun al-Rashid went there on a pilgrimage with five of his ministers. He touched the golden curtain at the entrance and it crumbled to dust. When Harun entered, he saw the tomb was blazing with light from the jewels in the wall and the throne and decorating the great monarch. His body had been embalmed and sat upon a royal throne dressed richly, but his robes also crumbled to dust when he touched them. Harun was so upset that he immediately placed his own costly robes on Nasharwan and asked for a gold curtain to be put up. The priest explained the words written on the tomb. Caliph Harun al-Rashid learned that his visit had been predicted by the dead monarch. The Prophecy Caliph Harun al-Rashid saw things written on the throne, the jewels and the walls of the tomb. He asked the priest to read and explain them. He was surprised to know that Nasharwan had predicted that the Caliph would come that day to his tomb with four good men and one bad man. It was also written that the Caliph would dress him in new robes and sprinkle fragrant perfumes on the tomb before going back. Harun had just done that. Then he wondered who could be the bad man among his ministers. The prophecy added that Harun would be rewarded and the bad man would be punished and destroyed. The prophecy of the monarch said that Harun would find an inscription under his throne which would reward him richly. Harun put his hand under the throne and drew out a glowing ruby. On it were directions to a treasure of gold, jewels and arms. The Traitor Among the five ministers who came with the Caliph was Hussein ben Sahil. He heard the prophecy and said, Sir, this is just a tomb for the dead. What's the use of riches and jewels here? Isn't it better to take some of it for the living? This made Caliph Harun very angry and he sent Hussein to worship inside the tomb. Hussein went in. But the sight of all that wealth made him even more greedy. He took a large ring from the hand of Nasharwan and came out. Seeing his face, the Caliph said, Look at him. Nasharwan's prophecy about one bad man with me was true. Search him. Hussein was searched and the ring he had stolen was found. The Caliph took the ring and put it back on Nasharwan's hand. Hussein was punished and the road to the tomb had been closed before Caliph Harun al-Rashid returned to his kingdom. The Wise Things Caliph Harun ordered that the treasure to which Nasharwan had given directions should be collected and sent to Baghdad to the royal treasury and armory. But the real treasure for him was also the great sayings of the wise monarch written on the walls and on his jewels and his crown. Nasharwan's words were wise and just. 
do not use your power to hurt others earn a good name rather than property don't feel sad about what can be broken stolen or lost do not be friend unkind and evil people do not be envious and angry do not spend more than you earn respect others including the women of your family meet wise people avoid cruelty and haste in action treat others exactly as you wish others to treat you the caliph harun asked that noshir was saying be written down in a book and ordered everyone in his kingdom should follow them Sinbad's first voyage Sinbad was an old man in the Middle East when he narrated his adventures to the visitors to his house He told them how he wasted the great deal of wealth that he had inherited and became so poor that he finally set sail on a merchant ship going to the East Indies through the Persian Gulf. They went to Baghdad and then sailed from Balsora selling their goods at ports and the towns on the way. One day some of them were resting on an island full of greenery. when they saw some of their shipmates signaling to them from the ship they were telling them that the island was actually a whale but they couldn't hear or understand anything suddenly the island moved and they were flung into the sea sinbad hung on to a log of wood they had used as firewood as he fell off the whale he never saw what happened to the others the island of king miraj fighting to stay afloat sinbad was exhausted when he reached a strange island with steep cliffs he clutched at some tree roots on the side of the cliffs to pull himself up to the top where he fell asleep on a patch of grass he was woken up by a bright light of the sun at noon feeling very hungry he ate whatever roots and herbs he could find and drank from the spring close by then he decided to walk around and explore the place he heard voices and followed them till he saw a man grazing some horses the man explained that he and his friends who were stable grooms had brought the horses of king miraj for grazing here as they did every year We must return to our master tomorrow he said asking Sinbad to come with them A welcome guest the stable groom took Sinbad to the court in the city and explained where they had found him Sinbad was taken to King Miraj whom he found to be extremely gracious He welcomed Sinbad warmly to his court and his island. He made sure that Sinbad was given every comfort and luxury. Sinbad repaid his courtesy and hospitality by telling him about his adventure. The king found it very interesting and made Sinbad a guest at his palace. Sinbad soon went around the city to meet merchants from whom he tried to find out how he could go back to his own land. He found strange things too in this kingdom such as fascinating island called castle guarded by a genie named Dijil. He saw so colorful and strange fish that he had never seen or imagined before. It was a strange land but he longed for home. Way back home Walking around the city, one day Sinbad reached the harbor. He recognized the merchant loading a ship as being the captain of the ship he had sailed in when he ended up on the way, and he discovered that there were some of the goods he had carried. The captain recognized him too and was very happy to see him alive. Sinbad told him about all the adventures he had. and how much he enjoyed seeing new people and places the captain was pleased to return all the goods to sinbad 
Back to being a merchant, Sinbad sold much of his merchandise in the city and when he returned home, he was a rich man. He built a splendid house for his family and had carriages and many servants. The story of his voyage was over and his guests went after he had given him gifts too. Chan the Magical Horse The storyteller told the ruler the stories of Siddiquud, the Bakshi and the younger Chan, the peaceful wanderer. The two Chan brothers lived not far from the house of seven magicians in the far off land of India. The elder brother became the magician's apprentice for seven years, but they wouldn't teach the secret of their magic to him. The younger Chan took food for his brother to the palace and peeping through the window, he learned the secret magic. One day, the younger Chan told his brother, there's a magical horse in the stable. Ride away on it and bring costly merchandise that we can sell here. But he warned, do not go to the magician's palace. The elder brother forgot the warning and rode to the magician's palace. The magicians realized that the horse was magical and captured him for a sacrifice. The elder brother didn't know that the horse was younger Chan. The Magician's Chase Chan the magical horse looked for a way to escape the evil magicians. He became a fish in a trough but the magicians changed into seven herons to catch him. Chan transformed into a dove and flew out of the stable. But they turned into hawks and pursued him. The dove took shelter in a peaceful cave in the east where a saintly bakshi sat telling his beads. Chan told him the story of his flight and hiding inside the first bead of the rosary, he told him to give the other beads to the magicians when they came in the form of seven beggars and asked the bakshi for his rosary. The other beads turned into worms that were eaten up by the magicians as seven chickens. But the last bead turned into a warrior who killed them with his sword. Then Chan returned to his form and bowed to the Bakshi. The Bakshi how can I show my gratitude, sir? asked Chan, for saving me and for wiping out the sin of killing these men. Go to the forest of death, where there lives Siddiqur. His upper body is made of gold and the lower of brass, and he has a silver head. Catch him and bring him to me, without speaking a word on the way back, said the Bakshi. Tell me how to capture him. Show me the way and give me something to eat," said Chan. The Bakshi gave him a loaf that would never finish, a moon axe and a long rope. Go through the forest, say these magical words if spirits stop you on the way and you will find Siddiqur under the Amiri tree," said the Bakshi. Tie him and put him in this sack. But remember not to speak on the way back. Chan set off to catch Siddiqur. Siddiqur's Catch Chan went to the forest of death. He chanted the magical words given by the Bakshi when some spirits and goblins attacked him and they fled. He reached the Amiri tree and startled Siddiqur who clambered up the tree. Chan tried to persuade him politely, but he refused to come down. Finally, Chan said angrily, If you don't come down, I will chop down this tree with my moon axe. Siddiqur was so frightened that he agreed to climb down. Chan tied him with a rope and put him into the sack. He ate some bread with Siddiqur. 
Then he lifted him on to his back to return. Sidney Gur said, It's a long journey. I will tell you a story as we go along. If you don't wish to tell me a story, shake your head. Chan shook his head and Sidney Gur spent the journey telling stories. The Friend's Journey In a kingdom, there lived six friends. A rich man, a mathematician, a mechanic, a smith, a physician and a painter. They set off to find their fortunes. Reaching a land full of rivers, they each planted a tree. We will follow one river each to its source and return here. If anyone's tree is withered, the others must find him. They decided. The rich man stopped to speak to an old couple down the way. They asked him to stay and marry their daughter. She was beautiful and the rich man married her. They lived content and happy. But one day, the king happened to see the wife and fell in love with her. He told his soldier to get rid of the rich man. They took him to a stream and buried him in a deep pit under the rocks. The friends returned to find the rich man's tree withered. So they set off to search for him. End of French The friends reached the river but saw no sign of the rich man. The mathematician calculated and found where the man was buried. The smith broke the rocks with his tools and located his body. The physician's medicine revived him. The rich man told the story about the wicked king taking away his wife. The mechanic built a large wooden bird and the painter painted it beautifully. The bird was hollow and could be flown by someone sitting inside. The rich man got into the bird and flew to the palace. The colourful bird attracted attention and the wife came to the roof to see it. The rich man came out and rescued his wife, taking her back with him. But when his friends saw her, they all wished to marry her. They fought among themselves in a fit of jealousy and so they all killed one another. The Evil Frogs Two evil, monstrous frogs lived in a marsh and blocked the flow of water into the fields of the kingdom. They would only allow the water to flow if a human being was sacrificed to them every year. Now the king's son was to be sacrificed, but his best friend offered himself to the frogs. Luckily, near the marsh, they heard the frogs talking. What fools they are, said the two frogs. If they cut off our heads, the water will flow smoothly, and they will have gold and brass coins flowing out of their mouths whenever they wish. The prince understood their language and told his friend. Together, they slew the frogs. The water flowed into the fields and the two friends found they could pour out gold and brass coins as they wished. If we return, they will think we are bewitched, said the prince. So they went along to seek their fortune. The Wise Minister At an inn, a widow and her daughter robbed them. When they walked on, they got a cap that made a person invisible from some children. The prince gave it to his friend. Sometime later, they got a pair of boots that could take them wherever they wished. They arrived in a strange land where the people made the prince their king and married him to the princess. His friend became his minister. One day, the minister saw the queen entertaining a stranger who came to visit her in form of a beautiful bird. 
he told the king. The next time the bird came, they caught it and flung it in the fire. It was badly scorched and after that it never came to meet the queen. The minister brought the widow and her daughter and punished them by turning them into donkeys till they learnt a lesson. Masang and the Witch In a farm, a strange man was born with horns and a tail like a cow. He was called Masang. He found a very dark-skinned friend and servant named Idar, son of the forest. Further on, they were joined by a man with green skin, son of grass, and another man with white skin, son of the rushes in a marsh. They reached an empty hut and stayed there. One would stay to cook while three went hunting. Itar stayed the first day and a little old woman came begging for food. But when he had fed her, he found it was all finished. He lied to the others that soldiers had come and eaten up everything. The same happened with the cream and the white man. But Masang outwitted the old woman, who was a witch, and thrashed her till she fled. He told his companions that they must catch her. The Ungrateful Companions They found her dead in a deep pit full of gold, jewels and armor. Masang suggested that they should draw up the treasure and then go forward. The others asked him to go down. We will pull you up, they said. But as soon as they got the treasure, the three ungrateful fellows fled with it, leaving Masang to die. But Masang chanted some magical words that made a tree grow in the pit. He climbed out and found his way to heaven. There, he was given a task of destroying the chief witch, who was injured by an arrow. Posing as a physician who had come to cure her, he killed the witch in a fierce battle. But before she was killed, she had hit Masang and he was injured so badly that he broke up to become seven stars in the sky. The Little Hunchback Outside the shop of a tailor in Kashgar sat a little hunchback singing and playing a tambourine. The tailor took him home so that his beloved wife too might enjoy the music. They invited the little hunchback to share their dinner. His wife served fish. Unluckily, a fish bowl stuck in the hunchback's throat and he choked to death. The tailor and his wife were terrified of the police. So they took the body to a doctor's house and left it there, telling a maid to ask the doctor to take care for the sick man. When the doctor came out, he fell over the hunchback and found him dead. He thought he had killed him. He and his wife put the body near the storehouse of their neighbor who supplied oil and butter to Sultan. He will not be punished for he knows the Sultan, thought the doctor. The Sultan's Justice the supplier thought the man outside the storehouse was a thief and hit him. With the light, he saw that the hunchback was dead. Frightened, he carried him to the market and propped him up against the door of a shop. A drunken merchant, swaying down the street, knocked the hunchback down. Both fell and were picked up by the night guard. You have killed him. The guard said and arrested the merchant. In the morning, he was taken to the court. The judge ordered the merchant to be executed. 
the news of the execution spread the supplier and the doctor came to stop the injustice each one said i killed the hunchback but the tailor explained how the hunchback had choked on the fish bone and died the sultan called all the fellows and they reached the palace hearing what had actually happened the sultan asked that this be written down in his history and pardoned the four men the seven stages of rustam long ago persia was a very peaceful and prosperous kingdom but it was ruled by a very restless and ambitious king named kaiz one day he heard that the neighboring kingdom of mezandara was beautiful with mountains rivers lush greenery flowers and birds and lovely maidens but it was also inhabited by demons under the ferocious white demon all the advice of his ministers could not stop him from wanting to conquer mezandara even the council of wise dal the father of great warrior rustam failed to stop him the king of mezindara called up the white demon and his hordes they defeated king kaiz and imprisoned him in a dungeon inside a fortress guarded by hundreds of demons dal was angry but he was dutiful towards the king kaiz therefore he called his son rustam and told him to go on his special horse raksh and rescue king kaiz rustam's journey rustam took a dangerous route on his horse raksh and he slept tired out he awoke to see raksh kicking an attacking lion to death rustam thanked god and raksh and proceeded further the next night Raksh saved Rustam from an enormous snake. Rustam thanked God and Raksh and went on. The next day, Rustam saw a beautiful maiden at a spring and thanked God for the sparkling water. On hearing God's name, the girl turned into a horrible witch and Rustam killed her. On the fourth day, Rustam's horse was grazing. when a gardener threatened him saying his master the strong man aulad would kill him for trespassing when aulad came rustam struck him down aulad was so frightened that he agreed to become his servant and lead him to king kaiz on the 6th day two demons attacked him and rustam killed them then he rescued king kaiz from the dungeon slaughtering many of the demons the white demon aulad told rustam that the demons slept during the day and awoke at night to attack others therefore on the 7th day rustam rested and then killed and scattered the guards of the white demon then he found the white demon inside a cave and cut off his leg the white demon was ferocious and still strong the terrible battle took place between rustam and the white demon then rustam caught the demon by his horns and dashed him to the ground taking out his dagger swiftly rustam stabbed the white demon and killed him his spell broke and all the demons died immediately Once the white demon and his hordes had been killed, Mezandara could not hold out against Rustam, who conquered it. Aulad, who had served Rustam faithfully, was rewarded by being placed on the throne of Mezandara as the governor on behalf of King of Persia. Caius learns a lesson. Caius returned to his throne richer and more powerful. He made fabulous palaces using the people till they got fed up of all the work he made them do. They wanted to destroy him and asked the devil's help. 
the devil sent a demon in guise of an astronomer and he got Gaius interested in astronomy. He tempted Gaius to go close to the stars and planets in the sky. Gaius was foolish enough to believe this. The false astronomer trained vultures to carry the throne into the sky and Gaius was delighted. But the vultures got tired and had nothing to eat. The throne started shuddering and the terrified Gaius would have fallen and died. But they dropped him down in a far away forest of China. Rustam sent soldiers to look for the king and he was brought back to Persia where he ruled quietly under Rustam's counsel. Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves In Persia, there lived two brothers. Qasim became prosperous after marrying a rich widow, while Ali Baba remained a poor woodcutter. Living on the wood, he chopped from the forest every day and sold. One day, hearing horses tramping, Ali Baba climbed up a tree after hiding his asses. He saw 40 thieves taking large bags from their horses' backs and following their chief to a rock. The chief said loudly, Open Sesame. A door opened in the rock. They entered and the door closed. After a while, they came out with empty bags and the chief said, Shut Sesame. The door closed and they rode away. Ali Baba stood before the rock and repeated, Open Sesame. When the door opened, he saw a cave full of gold and silver jewelry, gems, bags of gold coins, rich silk dresses and so much more. He collected as much gold as his asses could carry and closed the door of the cave, saying, Shut Sesame. Ali Baba's Secret When he reached home, Ali Baba carried in the bags containing the treasure and tightly closed all the doors and windows. Then, in whispers, he told his wife all about his strange adventure and warned her not to talk of it to anyone. She promised not to say a word. Later, she borrowed scales from Qasim's wife to measure the gold. Qasim's wife wondered what Ali Baba's wife wanted to weigh. So she quietly stuck a little dough on the scale when she gave it to her. When the scales were returned, she discovered Ali Baba's secret, for a piece of gold was stuck to it. She told Qasim. He managed to get the truth from Ali Baba and greedily decided to get some of the treasure himself. Meanwhile, the robbers had realized that some of their gold was missing. They were sure the thief would return for more and decided to catch him. Qasim's Greed Qasim went to the cave and stuffed a lot of gold into bags. But in his excitement, he forgot the magic words for getting out and was trapped. When the robbers returned, they cut him to pieces and they hung up the pieces. Qasim's worried wife sent Ali Baba to search for Qasim. He found his body in the cave and carried it home with some more gold. Marina, Qasim's clever maid, opened the door and he told her everything. We must stitch up his body and bury him without anyone knowing the truth said Ali Baba. Marina quietly brought an old cobbler named Mustafa blindfolded to Qasim's house and gave him some gold to stitch up his body. After that, she led him back to his house. Then Qasim's death was announced. After that day, Ali Baba and his wife moved to Qasim's house to live and to look after his family. The Truth Discovered 
the thieves knew someone had entered their cave when they saw that the body had been taken away we must find out who he was said the chief he sent a spy to the town and the man found mustafa who was boasting that he could stitch up not only shoes but also dead bodies that's wonderful said the spy but how can i believe you till you show me where you stitched up the body i can find the house if you blindfold me suggested mustafa when he led the spy to qasim's house the robber made the mark of a cross on the door with the chalk he returned to tell the chief what he found out we will go there at night decided the chief then we will get our treasure back marina however saw the chalk mark and realized what must have happened she marked all the neighbors doors with crosses the oil merchant a few times two thieves came for their treasure but couldn't find the house at night finally the chief himself went and he was able to remember the house even without the chalk mark as for punishment he killed the two thieves who had failed in their duty that night he disguised himself as an oil merchant carrying two jars each on 19 mules only one of those jars contained oil the rest hid the armed robbers inside he found ali baba sitting outside his house going politely to him the chief requested sir i am a stranger here to sell this oil it's late to seek a place to stay may i rest in your house so that i may sell this tomorrow in the market ali baba not recognizing the robber invited him to rest before going inside to sleep the chief whispered to the hidden thieves that he would give him a signal sometime in the night to come out clever marina when marina came into the yard one of the thieves thinking it was the chief asked softly is it time to come out marina was alert she whispered back not yet then peeping into the jars she found the robbers quickly she brought boiling oil and poured it into the jars killing all the robbers the chief was so frightened when he found all the robbers dead that he ran away Ali Baba and Marina dug a huge pit to bury the robbers. The chief however returned to take revenge and became friendly with Ali Baba's son. But Marina recognized him even in disguise and saw his dagger. She danced with a knife to entertain the guests and stabbed the chief to death. When she told Ali Baba about the robber chief in disguise, he was so happy that he married her to his son Ali Baba and his family lived prosperously with no fear of thieves No catches there was a poor fisherman who went every day to the sea to catch fish he had made it a rule to cast his net four times each day neither less nor more He would sell the fish he caught in the village market. One morning, he went as usual to the sea and cast his net. After a while, it felt heavy, and thinking he had a good catch, the fisherman drew in his net. He was shocked to see that he had drawn in the body of a dead ass. Disgusted, he threw away the carcass. His net had gone torn in places. so he repaired it before casting it again this time he dragged in a lot of garbage and waste once again he cast the net and found stones shells and mud in it somehow each throw had been a failure that day
the genie. The fisherman cast his net one last time. When he drew it in, a large copper jar lay in it. He saw that it was sealed with a lid. When he opened it, smoke came out and became an angry looking genie who threatened to kill him. The fisherman exclaimed, I helped you out of the jar. How can you kill me? The angry genie said, Choose the manner of your death. Someone has to pay for my imprisonment. The king of genies sealed me up in that jar and flung it into the sea. The genie continued, I thought I would reward the person who set me free. But time went by and I decided I would kill whoever opened the jar. Can you please show me how you got in? asked the fisherman. The genie showed him and as soon as he got into the jar, the fisherman flung it into the sea and ran. The Land of Ghouls Long ago in Persia, there was a place known as the Valley of the Angel of Death. Ghouls lived there. Travelers were terrified of passing through that land because the ghouls would lure them into their caves to rob and kill them. The ghouls were cannibals. No one had seen their real shape but they were said to be ghastly. They were shapeshifters and could transform themselves into any human being or animal or bird to trap the travelers. They spoke softly and made melodious music, laid out lavish feasts and comforts to entice those who passed that way. However, the ghouls, though evil and cruel, were rather stupid. The people of Isfahan were known for their clever and cunning nature. One day, a mean beg of Isfahan had to travel through the dreaded valley. Knowing he could meet a ghoul who would try to befool him, he decided, I must be prepared to outwit the ghoul. A mean beg meets a ghoul. A mean beg set off with an egg and a piece lump of salt in his pocket. As expected, a cool-looking human stopped him. Hello, aren't you Amin Beg? I am your old family friend Kareem. You have taken a wrong turn. I'll show you the way, said the ghoul. You are it Kareem, replied Amin. You are a ghoul. Before I come with you, let's see who is stronger. Amin picked up a stone and asked the ghoul to press some juice out of it. The ghoul tried but failed. Amin picked up the stone and hiding the egg in his palm, he squeezed it. The ghoul was amazed at the juice coming out. Then Amin asked the ghoul to crush a stone into salt powder. Again, the ghoul failed. This time, Amin crushed the lump of salt and the stunned ghoul tasted the salt. He took Amin to his cave to look after him. The cave. The cave was smelly and foul, with bones of dead men and animals everywhere. A lot of treasures, plundered by the ghoul, also lay there. The ghoul asked Amin to fill up a water bag made of skin from the stream inside, while he got some firewood to cook the food. The water bag was huge and Amin knew he couldn't carry it, so he dug a channel from the stream to bring water into the cave. He befooled the stupid ghoul to believe that he dug the canal for him to have water always. After the meal, the ghoul slept, but Amin was alert. He put a pillow into his bed and waited, hiding nearby. The ghoul got up stealthily and beat the bed seven times with a thick cudgel. In the morning, he was horrified to see Amin waking up alive and well. Frightened out of his wits, the ghoul ran away from the cave. Amin the Witty 
Amin collected all the treasure he could carry and came out of the cave to continue on his way. He saw the bull with his heavy cudgel on his shoulder coming back led by a fox. Foxes are wily creatures, thought Amin. This fox must have told the bull that I am not so strong as I pretended. Now I must befool the stupid bull before he attacks me. So he called out loudly, "Hey foxy, I told you to fetch 7 ghouls for me to take to Isfahan. You have brought back just one, the same fellow. Go and fetch some more." Before the fox could understand what was going on, the terrified ghoul said, "You befooled me, fox." He ran for his life. The fox realized that he had been outwitted by this clever man from Isfahan, and without waiting to hear anything more, he vanished into the forest. I mean, happily walked home. Sunshine and his brother. Once upon a time, there was a happy land over which. A king ruled with his kind wife. They had a son whom they named Sunshine. Unfortunately, the queen died, and later the king married another lady and had a son whom they named Moonshine. The boys loved each other, but as they grew up, the queen began to feel miserable that her son Moonshine would never be a king as Sunshine was older. She fell ill. and the king asked her what he could do to make her happy and well again only the fried heart of one of the king's sons can make me feel well again said the queen but sunshine is the heir and moonshine is my own son so how can i have either of them killed the king was so much in love with her that he told her she would have sunshine's heart the next day the hermit moonshine overheard the conversation between his parents and tried to tell sunshine that they were going to kill him sunshine decided to leave home immediately and moonshine said that he would go with him too after walking for many days they reached a dry river bed Moonshine was so exhausted that he fell down and couldn't get up. Sunshine went to look for some water, but he returned to find that Moonshine had died. He wept as he placed his body in a pit and covered it with stones. He found a hermit in a cave and told him about his brother. The hermit gave him some herbs to bring the boy back to life. Then both of you must come and live with me as my sons he added. Moonshine was revived and the boys began to live in the cave with the hermit as his sons. The crocodiles. In that kingdom there was a pair of crocodiles living at the source of the river. They couldn't let the water flow down unless the man born in the year of the tiger was offered to them as food. But some of the people brought their cows to graze near the cave and told the king that they had seen a man who was born in the year of the tiger living with the hermit. The king sent his soldiers. They brought sunshine to the palace in spite of the hermit's protests and tears. The princess. fell in love with him and said if he is thrown to the crocodiles you must throw me also to them when they were about to be thrown in sunshine tried to stop her but the princess was adamant the crocodiles hearing them were moved and let them go sunshine returned to the hermit and the princess to the palace The reward. The hermit who had been dreaming was delighted to see sunshine return. The king too was so happy that he said he must visit the hermit and his son, whose goodness had saved his daughter and his kingdom. 
He carried gifts for them and asked, "Are you really the hermit's son?" Then Sunshine told him about his father, the king, and how he and his brother had left home. The king was so impressed that he gave both his daughter in marriage to the brothers. He sent them to their father's palace with attendants and with rich gifts and jewels. Their father and mother had been grieving and feeling very guilty at what they had planned to do. When they saw their sons returning with their beautiful brides, there was great joy and celebration in the kingdom. The hermit was treated with great honor and courtesy for looking after their sons. The enchanted horse. The king of Persia held court in the city of Shiraz. People came from all over the world to offer him gifts and tributes. One day, an Indian came to his court with a wooden horse, richly caparisoned, wishing the king would take it and reward him. Apart from its jeweled saddle, bridle, and clothes, the king did not see what was special about it. It is an enchanted horse, sir," explained the Indian. "It can fly you anywhere you wish and return in a flash." The king asked him to demonstrate this by fetching a flower from a neighboring mountain. The Indian mounted, vanished, and returned within an hour with the flower. The king wanted the horse. He told the Indian to ask whatever he wished in return for it. The Indian asked. for the hand of the king's daughter which made the king's son angry the prince vanishes the king's son prince feroz shah was angry at the indian's request he said he was not convinced and wanted to test the horse without waiting to find out how to bring the horse down feroz mounted and rushed off vanishing from everyone's sight the king was so anxious and angry that he imprisoned the indian he ordered that if the prince didn't return the indian would be executed the prince searched for his palace and finally arrived at night outside a palace everyone was asleep so he went past the guards and attendants till he reached a room where a beautiful princess lay asleep on a couch he gently woke her up startling her but when he threw himself at her mercy she said she was princess of bengal they fell in love and she wished him to meet her father the revenge the prince wished to meet the king of bengal with his attendants and proper respect but then he suggested that they should go away to shiraz and return later for his blessings he took the princess on the enchanted horse to a mansion outside shiraz i will tell my father and then take you with all honor and ceremony to the palace he told her leaving her there the king of persia was overjoyed to see the prince who told him about the princess before leaving for the mansion the king ordered the release of the indian who had been in prison for 3 months he also gave him back his horse the indian was angry at the injustice he had received he rode the horse and kidnapped the princess the king of persia and prince feroz were horrified to see them flying over the palace The prince immediately decided he would search for his bride all over the world. The Sultan of Kashmir, the Indian brought the horse down in a beautiful valley on a mountain. He asked the princess to marry him, but the princess screamed. The Sultan of Kashmir was riding by and heard her. The Indian said she was his wife. but the princess said he was lying and she fainted the sultan ordered to execute the indian and the princess was carried to his palace 
he began preparations to marry her. The unhappy princess pretended to be very ill. Doctors were called, but there seemed to be no cure for her illness. The prince, who had reached Kashmir, heard of the princess's illness and went to her dressed as a physician. She began recovering as soon as she recognized Feroz. He told the sultan that if the horse on which she arrived was brought to her, she would recover fully. As soon as the horse came, he and the princess flew back to Shiraz. Sinbad's Second Voyage One day after a meal, Sinbad told his guests that wishing to travel again, he bought merchandise and sailed with other merchants, selling their goods at different islands. One day, they arrived at a deserted island thick with fruit-laden trees, springs and streams. While the others explored the island and ate fruits, Sinbad fell asleep under a tree. When he awoke, his companions and the ship had vanished. In order to be able to see more of the area, he climbed up a tree and looked down towards the sea, but couldn't see his ship anywhere on the horizon. Then he looked towards the other side of the island and noticed a large white object some distance away. Curious about it, he came down from the tree and went in that direction to see what it was that he had seen from the treetop. The Rock Sick After walking a while, Sinbad came to a huge white hole, big as a hill. He walked around looking for some footholds to climb up but there was none. Nor could he find any door or opening into it. Suddenly, it became dark and Sinbad thought that it was going to rain. But looking up, he saw that the dark cloud was coming lower and he found it was a huge bird. He had heard stories from sailors about this great bird called rock. This white ball must be its egg, he realized. The rock settled down to roost on its egg, covering it with its wings. Sinbad watched it and thought it could help him escape. He untied his turban and tied himself to a leg of the rock very firmly. In the morning, it will fly away for food and I will be able to escape from here. Tied to its leg, thought Sinbad. The Valley of Diamonds Sinbad waited patiently for dawn when the rock flew off, carrying him till it came down in an island far away. Sinbad untied himself quickly as soon as the rock came down, just as it caught a huge snake and flew away. Sinbad found himself surrounded by steep mountains in a valley in which lay enormous diamonds, guarded by hundreds of huge snakes. They went into their caves as daylight grew. Sinbad hid himself in a cave and came out in the morning to plan what to do. Suddenly, he saw large pieces of meat dropping into the valley. He had heard that when eagles had to feed their young ones, sailors and merchants threw meat into the valley to make diamonds stick to them. Then the eagles would carry away the meat to their nests. The merchants arranged to own the nests and showing away the birds, they would pick up the diamonds. Sinbad's Escape Sinbad collected big diamonds and stuck them into a large piece of meat that he tied on his back with his turban and lay face down, hoping that an eagle would pick up the meat. An eagle did just that and carried him to its nest. The merchant who owned that nest came to get diamonds and found Sinbad there. Sinbad offered him the diamonds but he took just one. He took Sinbad to his ship to sail homewards. They saw the island of Rohat with strange things like camphor trees and rhinoceros and 
animal with a huge horn. The rhino fought against an elephant and both the animals got killed. The rock carried them to feed its young ones. Simba purchased merchandise with the diamonds and sold them. From Balsora, he returned to Baghdad. It had been a delightful story and his guests went home wondering at Simba's great courage. The Three Brothers In Baghdad, a merchant died leaving a thousand gold coins for each of his three sons. They set up shops as merchants. After a while, the eldest brother was bored and wished to travel. He sold off his shop and its wares and went off to try his fortune. He returned after a year and came to his youngest brother. He looked like a beggar, for he had lost everything. The youngest brother had used his money wisely and increased it to 2,000 gold coins. So he gave half of that to his elder brother who set up his shop again in the market. Sometime later, the second brother wanted to see the world. Therefore, selling off his shop, he went away with the caravan. Like his elder brother, he returned poor and broken. Once again, the youngest brother helped him and he too started his shop. For some years, things went well with the brothers. The Jealous Brothers Some time later, the two elder brothers persuaded the youngest one to travel. He had 6,000 gold pieces. He gave them a thousand each and buried 3,000 in his house. They loaded a ship with goods and set off trading at various ports. At one port, a beautiful but poor woman asked the youngest brother to marry her. Reluctantly, he agreed. She turned out to be kind and good and her husband was very happy as they prospered. But this made the elder brothers very jealous. One night, they threw the couple into the sea. They did not get drowned for the wife was actually a fairy with magic powers. She whisked them back to their home. But she was so angry that she decided to punish his brothers. The younger brother dug up the coins and set up shop. Then he found two black dogs in his house. They were his brothers. The fairy had vanished. The man and his hind. An old man always went everywhere leading a hind tied with a rope. When he was asked why he took her everywhere, he said she was his wife. He explained that they had no children, so he had adopted the son of a slave as his son and looked after his mother too. When his son was 10 years old, the man had to go away for more than a year. His wife learned magic and changed his son into a calf and its mother into a cow. She handed over both of them. When the man returned, she told him that the mother had died and the son had vanished a few months ago. The man hoped his son would return. But for months, there was no sign of him. The man grieved always for his lost son and felt great pity for the dead slave. The Deception Discovered Some months later, a feast was to be held. The man told his steward to sacrifice one of the cows. Unfortunately, it was the slave who was sacrificed. But she was found to be so thin that the man called for a fat calf instead. To his wife's delight, it was his son who was brought. But when the calf fell at the man's feet and wept, he refused to kill it. The steward told the man, My daughter knows magic, sir. She says that the calf is actually your son. The man asked the girl if she could turn the calf back into his son and she agreed, on condition that she married his son and punished his wife as she had harmed him. The man consented and as soon as the calf became his son, he married the steward's daughter. She turned his wife into a hind 
and he led her on a rope. The King of Persia The King of Persia was loved by his people as the kingdom was prosperous and the king was kind and just. One day, a merchant came to his court leading a slave girl who he presented to the king. She was so beautiful that the king fell in love with her and decided to marry her and make her his queen. He loved his wife dearly and gave her lavish gifts, robes of silk, jewels, gold and works of art. But he always found her sad, looking out of the window in her chamber at the sea. She never spoke to anyone, the attendants, the ministers and courtiers or even to the king. A year later, a son was born and the king's happiness knew no bounds. He begged the queen to speak to him and tell him why she was so unhappy and silent always. The Queen's Story The queen finally spoke, thanking the king for his kindness and gifts. She told him she loved him too now, but she was unhappy because she missed her family and kingdom. I am Gulnar, the sister of Saleh, the king of sea, said the queen. Their country was conquered by an enemy and they were forced to hide. Saleh wanted her to marry the king of earth so that she might be safe from the wicked people around them. But she did not wish to marry him and when she could not make Saleh understand, she quarrelled with him and ran away to the island of the moon. An evil man, seeing her beauty, kidnapped her and wished to marry her. However, she stubbornly refused to marry him. As a punishment, the evil man sold her as a slave to the merchant who had brought her to the court of the king of Persia. The Queen's Family Queen Gulnar became more cheerful after sharing her story with the king. She often spoke about the wonders of her brother's kingdom, the fabulous palaces and the jewels. One day, the king said he would be glad to meet her brother and family. Gulnar was very happy and cast a magic spell into the fire in her chamber to summon her brother. King Saleh came with some of his relatives. She asked the king to watch from behind the curtains till she had reassured her brother first so that the two kings might not quarrel. King Saleh was delighted to see her looking so happy after so long. He requested her to return to the kingdom of the sea with him. Then she called her husband and introduced him telling her brother how well she was cared for and how much she loved her husband. The two kings met each other with great courtesy and affection. Baby Badar's visit It was a day of great joy for the king and queen of Persia. A feast was held in honor of the king of the sea. The best moment was when the royal baby was brought to meet his maternal uncle. King Saleh was delighted to see his nephew Badar. Taking him up in his arms, he leapt out of the window into the sea. The king of Persia was horrified, but Queen Gulnar told him that Saleh had taken the baby to visit his mother's old home and he would be very safe. The king waited anxiously and soon Saleh returned with Badar who was chuckling happily. But Saleh had come with many attendants bearing rich gifts from his kingdom, emeralds, rubies and pearls for his sister and the king of Persia. And there were special gifts for Badar too. The happiness of the king of Persia and queen Gulnar was complete. The Magical Jar Once upon a time, there lived a man who was so wild 
that the governor of the province sent him away to make his fortune and improve himself. Reaching a forest, he saw a dead horse. He took its head and was about to go on when he saw some evil spirits coming there. Carrying the horse's head, he quickly climbed up a tree to save himself. The spirits wore clothes made of bark and sat down under the same tree to eat and drink. The horse's head fell from the man's hand onto the spirits. Terrified, they ran away. The man came down next morning, tired and hungry. Everything had vanished except a small golden jar of wine. He was thirsty, so he took a sip of wine. Immediately, food was laid out for him. This is the magical jar, he thought. It will fulfill all my wishes. He set off happily on his journey. The Traveler's Treasures He met a man holding a fine sword. This sword will go after anyone who takes anything from me and fetch it back. The man boasted. The Traveler told him about the magical jar and offered to exchange it. The man gave him the sword and walked away with the jar. The traveller told the sword to fetch his jar. It killed the man and brought back the jar. In the same way, the traveller got a hammer. If it was struck nine times on the ground, an iron ball nine pillars high would rise to protect you. He walked along and found a man carrying a goat skin sack. If you shake it, Rain will fall, said the man. The more you shake it, the heavier the rain fall. The traveller took the sack and then he got back his golden jar, killing him too. Having got four treasures, he decided to return home. The Governor's Cruelty The traveller returned home and showed all his treasure to his mother. He had decided to punish the governor for unjustly exiling him. At night, he went stealthily to the palace and nearing it, he struck the hammer nine times on the ground. A huge iron ball came up all around him and his mother. When the governor awoke, he saw the ball and realized that the wild man must be back. I will show him which of us is the stronger, he declared. He ordered his men to burn fire all around the wall to heat up the iron. The iron grew hot and the traveller's mother was worried. My son, we shall die inside these walls, she cried. But the traveller laughed. No, we won't, mother, he said as he took out the goatskin sack that he had saved up for just such a moment. The punishment. The traveller shook the goatskin sack and it began to rain. As he shook it harder, the rainfall became steadily heavier, pouring down on the fire and on the men who were lighting them. The fire that had been lit around the iron wall was doused by the rain. Realizing the power of the sack, the traveller began to shake it really hard for a long time. The place filled up with water and the sea began to come in. People were running away, leaving the iron wall and the mansion of the governor. Before the governor got away, the rising tide of the sea had swept him away and his mansion. The governor was no more. No one called the traveller a wild man anymore. In future, all the people called him the wonderful man who had defeated the cruel and unjust governor and freed the province. The Merchant and the Genie Once upon a time, there was an extremely rich merchant who travelled to many places to sell his merchandise. Once, his journey took him to a land far away and the road passed through a desert where nothing was available to eat. The merchant therefore decided to carry some biscuits and dates for the journey. 
His trade was successful and he had to return through the same desert on his way back home. He stopped to rest and drink water at an oasis. Tying his horse to one of the trees, he sat down in the shade of a walnut tree. He pulled out his packet of food and ate the dates, throwing the seeds away. Kneeling beside the small pool to wash his hands and drink water, he was startled by the sudden appearance of a ferocious looking genie, carrying a gleaming sword. I'll kill you, said the genie, for you have killed my son. A promise. The frightened merchant stammered. But I have just been eating dates. I haven't killed anyone. The angry genie replied. One of the date seeds you threw hit my son in the eye and killed him. The merchant said it was an accident and pleaded to the genie to spare his life. But the furious genie wanted revenge. Finally, when his pleading failed, the merchant requested him to permit him to return home for one year so that he might bid farewell to his family and settle his affairs. I promise I will return to take your punishment, said the merchant. The genie was very suspicious because he was quite sure that the frightened merchant might not return. But when the merchant kept weeping and promising him, he finally allowed him to go. If you don't return after a year, threatened the genie, I shall kill you and your family. Waiting for the genie The grief-stricken merchant returned home to tell his family about his promise to the genie. They wept and moaned. After settling his house and trade, he bade his family goodbye and returned to the oasis. He waited under a tree for the genie. After a while, an old man leading a hind came there and asked the merchant why he was sitting in such a dangerous place. When the merchant told him what had happened, he decided to stay and watch the outcome of this strange story. He tied his hind to a tree and settled down with the merchant to wait. After some time, another old man came along, leading two large black dogs, followed by a third one who was dragging along a mule. Both of them were also curious about the men waiting under the tree. When they heard the merchant's story, they too joined the others under the tree to wait for the genie. Strange Stories The merchant and his companions watched a cloud of dust race across the desert. It was the genie with his sword who came to kill the merchant. The old men pleaded with him for the merchant's life. We'll tell you far stranger stories than the merchants, they said. The genie agreed to hear their stories. If I find your story stranger than the merchants, I will pardon one third of his sin, assured the genie. He sat down to listen to their stories. Each of the old men told the story about their companions, the hind, the two black dogs and the mule. As each story was told, the genie found it stranger and more amazing than the merchant's tale. Each time he forgave one third of the merchant's sin. Thus, at the end of the three stories, the genie completely forgave the merchant. The merchant thanked the genie and the three old men began riding joyfully back home. The Merchant of Baghdad Long ago, in the city of Baghdad, there was a merchant named Ali. Once, he had to go on a long journey that would take time. Selling off most of his things, Ali placed a thousand gold coins in a large jar for use when he returned. To keep it safe, he placed a layer of olives on top of the coins before closing the jar tightly. 
He took it to another merchant and asked him to keep his jar of olives safely till he returned. His friend gave him the warehouse key and told him to put it there himself. Placing it there, Ali returned the key and went away. For seven years, there was no news of him. One evening, the merchant remembered the jar and suggested to his wife that they should open it or the olives would drop. She disagreed as it would be a betrayal of Ali's trust. The Merchant's Deception The merchant ignored his wife's advice and opened the jar. The olives on top had become stale and rancid, so he threw them away. He was surprised to see the gold coins below. He thought, Ali's been away for seven years and there's no news. He must be dead. I will keep these gold coins for myself. He removed the gold and filled the jar with fresh olives and put it back. A few weeks later, Ali returned and asked for his jar. The merchant gave him the key and asked him to take it from the warehouse. Ali took it to his house and opened it. He was shocked to see the jar full of fresh olives instead of his gold coins. He returned and told the merchant to give back his gold coins. But the merchant angrily denied touching the jar. The quarrel became so bad that they finally took it to the court of Caliph Harun al-Rashid. The Mock Court The Caliph used to walk around in disguise every evening with his wazir to see how his kingdom and its people were doing. One evening, he saw the strange sight. A group of boys were holding a mock court on the street trying the case of Ali and the merchant as the case had become very well known in the city. The mock judge was supposed to be the Caliph. He asked Mok Ali to explain what his complaint was. After hearing him and the mock merchant, the mock judge called for two experts on olives. The mock experts looked at the olives in the jar and said, they are very fresh, they couldn't be possibly seven years old. This proved that the mock merchant was telling a lie. So the mock judge asked the culprit to pay back mock Ali's gold coins or he would be severely punished. The caliph and his wazir watching this play were very impressed by the justice of the boys. The caliph decides. The next morning, Ali with his jar of olives, the merchant and two experts in olives were summoned to the court. The caliph also asked the boy who had acted as the mock judge to come. First, Ali was asked to explain his complaint. Then, the merchant gave his explanation. The jar of olives was opened and the caliph tasted an olive and asked the boy to taste one too. They both found that the olive was fresh. The experts were asked to taste them and say if they could be 7 years old. The experts tasted the olives and said that the olives were fresh, not stale. In seven years, the olives would have rotted. The merchant realized he was caught lying. He admitted his guilt and got the gold coins from his house and returned them to Ali. This saved him from severe punishment. The caliph rewarded the boy richly for his wisdom. The King and the Physician Long, long ago in Persia, there was a Greek king who suffered from a strange illness that seemed incurable. All the physicians in the court and the kingdom had been summoned and each remedy had been tried. But nothing seemed to help the sick king. A new learned physician arrived at the court to cure the king. He hollowed out the handle of a polo club and put his medicine made of herbs inside and wrapped it. He took it to the king and told him to play polo every morning. Then he must return and rest. Surprisingly, the Greek king was cured as the medicine seeped through the handle 
and his hands into him. When the king rewarded him richly, the jealous vizier spoke ill of the physician, poisoning the king's mind and turning him against the physician. He said the physician was trying to kill him and take his kingdom. The ungrateful king, the angry king, forgetting that the physician had cured him, ordered that the treacherous physician should be beheaded. The poor physician was executed, but before that he was asked to state his last wish. He said, Sir, place my head on this book, which contains all the magical remedies I make. You must read the book yourself for only then the remedies will be revealed. The king agreed and the physician's head was placed on the book before the king began reading it. He would turn each page, lick his finger and then turn the next page and the next. The physician had poisoned each page and when the king licked his finger to turn the pages, he swallowed the poison. By the time the king reached the last page, he was dizzy and weak. As he finished reading, he died. The physician had punished the ungrateful king. The Faithful Parrot There was a poor man who loved his beautiful wife very much. Since he went to work every morning, he bought a talking parrot to keep her company. He also told the parrot to tell him all that happened during the day. One day, the parrot told him his wife had been lazy and dishonest and the man scolded her. The woman decided to teach the parrot a lesson. She told her servants to grind the hand mill loudly, sprinkle water on the parrot's cage and to flash a mirror in front of the cage. That evening, the man returned and asked the parrot what had happened during the day. It said, I could see and hear nothing because of the rain, thunder and lightning. There had been no rain that day. The man thought that the parrot was lying. In anger, he killed the parrot while his wife was happy to be free of it. The Wazir punished. The king loved his son dearly and when the son wished to go hunting, the king sent his Wazir with him to watch over him. Once, the prince galloped through the forest, leaving the Wazir and the attendants behind. The prince suddenly found himself alone and there was no sign of the Wazir. He saw a beautiful lady, looked like a princess, sitting by a path looking miserable. She said she had fallen off her horse and it had bolted. The prince put her on his horse and took her to her home. To his surprise, she stopped at a ruined palace. As he waited, he heard her speak, saying, Children, I have brought a fat young man for you to eat. Horrified, he realized the danger for she was really an ogress. He leapt onto his horse and raced all the way back home. For having lost the prince, the poor wazir was punished. The Wazir's Revenge Once a prince visited his uncle, the king and his cousin. He met his cousin but his uncle was away. His cousin had a beautiful lady as his guest. After a lavish meal, his cousin, carrying a pickaxe and a little plaster, took his guest to a place where he opened a door with a pickaxe. It was a tomb. His cousin looked at the prince and said, You must go back now. He went in with the lady and closed the door. The prince returned to his kingdom to find the city captured by the wicked wazir. The prince, on the wazir's orders, was blinded in one eye. It was the vengeance of the wazir for the prince having injured him when he was a child. The wazir ordered 
that the prince be killed. But the men who took him away to kill him, pitying him, told him to go away quickly. Escape to Baghdad The prince escaped and reached his uncle, who looked sad because he did not know where his son was. The prince told his uncle about his earlier visit, meeting his cousin and the beautiful lady and going to the tomb. His uncle rushed there and broke open the door which had been sealed with a plaster by his cousin. Inside, his cousin and the beautiful lady lay dead. His cousin died without telling his father that he wished to marry her. The king was heartbroken, but his troubles were not over. Suddenly, the kingdom was attacked by the forces of the wazir. The prince joined his uncle in defending the kingdom, but the king was already disheartened by his son's death. The wazir's forces defeated them and killed his uncle too. The prince escaped to Baghdad, finding shelter and peace in the kingdom of Caliph Harun al-Rashid. The Treacherous Wazir A king arranged marriage for his son with a neighboring king's daughter and decided to send the prince to meet his future wife, accompanied by his wazir. He didn't know that the wazir was disloyal. A cousin of the princess wished to marry her but had been rejected. That cousin sent a message to the treacherous wazir to either kill the prince or somehow to spoil his chance to marry the princess. As they journeyed through a desert, the wazir told the prince that there was a spring of fresh water close by called El Sahara. The prince dismounted and washing his hands and face, he drank from the spring. Immediately, he turned into a woman, for it was a magical spring and the wazir had known that. The prince wept and asked the wazir to return. He decided not to go back home or to meet the princess till he found a solution or till he died. Saving the Prince As the prince sat grieving, a horseman rode up to him and asked him why he was sad. The prince told his story and the man replied, You have been betrayed by your father's wazir. He is the only man who knew the secret of this spring. The man took the prince with him, telling him he could help him. He said, I am the son of the king of jinns. At the palace of the jinns, the prince was looked after with great courtesy before they reached the dark land where there was a spring of sparkling water. This is the spring of the woman, said the jinn. Drink and be well. The prince drank the water and in a flash he became his usual self. The jinn sent him to the princess whom he married. Then he returned with his pride to his father to tell him of the treachery of the wazir. Sinbad's Third Voyage Sinbad set off on a ship with merchants from Balsora. They traded at many towns and ports till their ship was driven off its course by a violent storm. The captain was worried because he knew that the island on which they had arrived was the home of a tribe of dreadful hairy dwarfs who came in crowds to attack and kill people. Even before they could understand his warning, the sailors had seen hordes of the savage dwarfs charging at them. Though they were only about two feet high, they were fierce and covered with reddish fur. The ship was trying to get away, but the dwarfs leapt into the water and reaching the ship, they scrambled up its sides. They took the sailors to a lonely island and leaving them there, they returned to their own island. The sailors were trapped with no way to escape. An enormous black giant. The sailors searched for shelter or escape. Seeing an enormous castle, 
they went inside hoping to get some help there entering through the massive gates they stopped stunned by the sight that met their eyes heaps of human bones lay scattered everywhere and a human being was roasted on a large fire the hungry and exhausted sailors collapsed seeing this horror completely frightened they continued to lie there silent and terrified as the sun began to set suddenly the floor shook and the place was filled with a loud thundering sound they heard heavy footsteps coming closer and peered through the falling darkness their fear increased tenfold the creature that entered the room was an enormous black giant with one glaring eye in the center of his forehead and long sharp teeth and nails like claws his lower lip dangled loose upon his chin and he had huge elephant like ears that flapped the giant is blinded the giant began to prod the sailors to select the fattest one the giant poked at sinbad but was disgusted at the thin and scrawny yogi he selected a fat sailor and to the sailors horror he pinned him on a skewer roasted him on the fire and ate him up then the giant slept till morning when he went out leaving the sailors in despair every night the giant roasted and ate the sailors one after the another the remaining sailors began to secretly plan their escape and secretly made rafts from driftwood one night when the giant fell asleep nine of them took skewers and blinded the giant roaring with pain the giant tried to catch the sailors who hit themselves the wounded giant charged out of the castle the sailors picked up the rafts ran to the shore and set sail the giant supported by other giants hurled rocks at the rafts smashing some narrow escape only sinbad and two sailors survived to reach an island with tempting fruit laden trees they fell asleep waking up to see a huge snake swallowing one of the sailors both of them climbed up a tree and stayed there but that night the snake ate up his friend too the next morning sinbad made a kind of tent with pieces of wood and reeds to hide in till he could reach the shore there he saw a ship and waved and shouted till the sailors saw him he was fetched aboard exhausted and ragged the captain who looked familiar gave him fresh clothes he said they had some merchandise of a sailor who had died sinbad saw they were his own goods the captain was very happy that he was alive they sailed to balsora trading on the way at various ports and cities and then sinbad went home to baghdad The Wonder Tree. Once upon a time, there lived a chief named Ali bin Ahmad and his tribe in the desert of Arabia. They encamped on the trackless sand. For months, they did not see any stranger. One evening, however, little Zuleika, the chief's daughter, saw someone riding her way from the south. She ran to tell her father. The chief came out of his tent and saw a stranger. The stranger said that the great Sheikh Ben Nadi would visit the tribe the next day. There was excitement in the entire camp. Everyone started collecting and preparing gifts for Sheikh Ben Nadi. But little Zuleika sat alone weeping because she had no gift for the Sheikh. Zuleika went and sat on a great stone near the well and cried. All of a sudden A misty white figure appeared out of the well and took the shape of a beautiful veiled woman. It was the good fairy of the well. The gift. The fairy asked Zuleika 
moved to be and said that she would find the gift the next morning at the very spot where her tears were falling then the fairy faded away sulika ran back to her tent the next morning she hurried out into the sand to find the gift which she was to get for the sheik the day Zuleika reached the well and stopped in wonder. Where yesterday there was nothing but bare sand, today there stood a tall tree with a cluster of brownish fruit. In the afternoon, the caravan of the great Sheik Ben Nadi arrived. Everyone brought his gifts and gave them to the Sheik. The chief led Ben Nadi to the well with a deep brown view and told him how the wonder tree had grown up miraculously during the night during everything ben nadi softly exclaimed this is the most precious gift of all for it springs from the desire of the heart the man who never loved there was a young man in persia who inherited a large amount of wealth from his father but he wasted everything and became so poor that he had to get himself hired a sheik came to the market and hired the young man sheik said he would live a comfortable life in his house and look after the 10 sheiks who lived there however he laid down one condition if he saw the sheiks weeping he must never ask the reason for it the young man agreed and went to the sheik's house It was a grand mansion with beautiful decorations and gardens. He was fed and clothed and given a chest with 30,000 pieces of gold to look after the 10 sheiks. One by one the sad sheiks died and were buried. Before his master died, he had told the young man to live there but never open that door to which he pointed. The sad man the young man was curious and opened the door he entered a beautiful garden where an eagle swooped down and carried him off to an island across the sea he was taken in a ship to a land where an army met him and took him to meet the queen of that land she was beautiful and all her soldiers and ministers were women she married the young man and made him king but she pointed to a door and said that he must never open that he agreed and lived happily for 7 years one day however he became curious and opened the door he found the eagle there and it picked him up and carried him back to the mansion of the 10 sheiks he had no way of going back and realized that the sheiks must have been through the same experience He lost that beautiful life and never laughed again. The Birdman. A farmer had three daughters and they took turns to watch the cows when they went out to graze. One day, the eldest daughter fell asleep and lost one calf. Searching for the calf, she reached a big house with a red door. She went in and opened a golden, a silver and a brass door she found a white bird in a golden cage she asked the bird about her calf the bird said if you marry me i will tell you but the girl refused and returned home the next day the same thing happened to the second sister on the third day however the youngest girl agreed to marry the bird and got the calf back she married the bird some days later She went to attend the feast and saw a warrior on a white horse riding around the gathering. An old woman told her that was her husband. The cage. The girl asked how she could get her husband into his human form always because she did not want to remain as the wife of a bird. Stay home next time. There is a feast and after he has ridden away burn his cage said the old woman the girl stayed back at the next feast and when her husband went away she burned the cage he came back and found it gone 
Despairingly he cried out, "What have you done? That cage was my soul." The girl was miserable, for he said that the evil spirits would take him away. Sit behind the door and make a clanging noise with the sword for seven days and nights," instructed her husband. The moment the noise stops, the spirits will take me away. For six days and nights, the girl stayed awake, clanging the sword. On the seventh night, her eyes shut for an instant, and her husband vanished. Finding the birdman, the girl set off in search of her husband. She walked miles over mountains and deserts, looking around everywhere for her husband. She came to a river on a mountain and heard his voice groaning. She ran towards it and saw him carrying many worn boots on his back. "What are you doing here, my husband?" asked the girl. "I am a servant of the evil spirits," now he explained. "I have to do their bidding. These are all the boots I have worn out fetching water for the evil spirits." Because they make me do all their menial jobs," he said. The girl felt very sad and guilty too, for he had been forced into this state because of her folly. First, she burnt his cage, and then she fell asleep, and she wept for him. "How can I help you?" she asked. The birdman returns. I am so happy to see you after all this time," said the birdman to his wife. "If you truly wish me to return, you must go back home and build a bird cage for me. Then, sitting near it, pray for me to return honestly and with a sincere heart. It will become my soul again, and I will return to it. Till then, farewell." Saying this, the birdman vanished. His wife looked around and then trudged all the way back over mountains and deserts till she reached home. She built a bird cage like the one birdman had earlier, and she sat near it, praying with all her heart for her beloved husband to return. One day, there was a great shout of joy as the white bird flew back home and sat on the roof of the house. The girl welcomed her husband home, and they lived. Happily ever after. The cobbler's wife, Ahmed the cobbler, lived in Isfahan with his greedy wife Sitara. She was a very discontented woman. One day, Sitara went to the hammam where people came to bathe and relax. There, she saw the wife of the royal astrologer in gorgeous clothes and jewelry. Being waited upon by several maids, Sitara returned home in a temper. When Ahmed welcomed her with a smile, she pushed him away, saying, "You are so useless. Become an astrologer. Then I can live a good life like the astrologer's wife." "My dear, I am a cobbler," replied Ahmed. "I am not trained in astrology. I don't care." announced Sitara stubbornly you have to become an astrologer so poor hemat who loved his wife bought all the things he would need to show he was an astrologer he set up a table in market displaying the 12 signs of the zodiac the sun moon and stars and several books The new astrologer. Everyone who knew the cobbler stopped to stare at Ahmed. One of his friends asked, "Ahmed, are you crazy? You are a cobbler. What are you doing as an astrologer?" Ahmed explained that he was doing this to please his wife. Just then, the king's jeweler came by, deeply distressed. He had lost a priceless ruby from the king's crown. When he saw a crowd around Ahmed, he decided to ask the astrologer to find the lost jewel. 
His wife's maid heard him and ran to her mistress for the jeweler's wife had stolen the ruby. If the astrologer tells him I am lost, thought the wife and she told Ahmed the truth. Hide the ruby under the jeweler's pillow, said Ahmed and say nothing. Ahmed called the jeweler and told him the ruby was under his pillow. The jeweler was so happy at the return of the jewel that he rewarded Ahmed richly. Ahmed's fame Sitara sent Ahmed back to work as an astrologer. Soon his fame spread. Ahmed hated to be fool people, but he had no choice. For his wife threatened to tell everyone he was a fraud. The next day, Ahmed was summoned by the king. Frightened, he went to the court. Forty chests containing the king's treasure had been stolen, and the king wanted Ahmed to find them. Ahmed said, Forty men have stolen the treasure. I need at least forty days to find out, sir. Ahmed went home and told his wife that they must run away. But she insisted that he should find the treasure or she would betray him to the king. Now Ahmed was sure his wife loved wealth only and he was going to die in 40 days. So he told her to give him one date every night before he went to sleep so that he might count the 40 days. The King's Treasure The robber chief, hearing about Ahmed, sent one of his men to watch his house at night. Ahmed's wife gave him a date and he put it into a jar, sighing. This is one of the forty. The robber ran back to the chief and said, Ahmed knew I was there. The next day, the chief sent two men. He said, that's two of them. They too returned, frightened. He knew we were there, and so every day one more robber went, till on the fortieth day he said, Forty complete. That night the robber chief called out to Ahmed, Sir, we'll return the chests. Please save us. Ahmed, realizing they were the robbers, replied, Put them all in the old ruins behind the palace and don't cheat. The next morning, Ahmed led the king to his treasure. The king was so pleased that he married Ahmed to his kind and good daughter, for Ahmed's wife had left him. Sinbad's Fourth Voyage It was not long before Sinbad sailed away again this time from a Persian port. Their ship was, however, wrecked by a violent hurricane wherein most of the people died. Sinbad was one of the fortunate survivors who reached the shore of an island. After sleeping, the men awoke to search the island for help. Seeing a few huts, they started walking towards them when they found themselves surrounded by dark men from the village. They were captured and taken into their huts. Sinbad and five men were given some herbs that the others ate. They were immediately driven mad. Sinbad pretended to eat and was safe. The villagers then fed them rice which the others ate. Sinbad was alert and understood that they were being fed so that the villagers might eat them after they were sufficiently fat. While his companions were eaten up, he became thin and saved himself. Freedom from Cannibals Considering him quite harmless, the villagers set an old man to guard Sinbad and permitted to walk around. One day, Sinbad ran away to the shore where he found some white men collecting pepper. To Sinbad's relief, 
they spoke Arabic. He told them about adventures, particularly the wild men on the island. Collecting the pepper they needed, they left the island, taking Sinbad to their own country where their king welcomed him and treated him with great hospitality. Sinbad founded a prosperous kingdom, but everyone rode horses bareback. No bridles or stirrups were used. So he asked a craftsman to make a beautifully embroidered saddle and some spurs which he presented to the king. The king was delighted and happily rode using this new saddle and spurs. He requested Sinbad to get them made for all his ministers and officers. Sinbad had become a royal favorite and was popular too. Buried alive, Sinbad became very rich soon, receiving many gifts from the king who finally insisted that Sinbad should marry a beautiful lady and stay in his kingdom. After much argument, Sinbad finally agreed and got married to a lady chosen by the king. They were happy till something unfortunate happened. The wife of Sinbad's neighbor was dead. Sinbad came to know that according to the law prevalent in the kingdom, when a person died, the wife or husband was buried alive with him or her. Struck with horror, Sinbad saw his neighbor's wife being taken for burial along with her husband. After her body was placed in a large pit, her husband was given seven loaves of bread and a jar of water and buried alive in the pit with her. This happened even to foreigners. Unfortunately, Sinbad's wife died and poor Sinbad was also buried. He sat in the dark pit trying to make the bread and water last longer. A Lucky Escape When the loaf and water finished, Sinbad was desperate. Then a dead man was buried in the pit with his poor wife. Sinbad heard a faint sound and followed it till he found a crack in the wall. Though it was very narrow, he crawled through it till he saw a dim light. The passage led to the shore. Returning to the pit, Sinbad collected all the jewels and valuable things and went to the shore. Luckily, he saw a ship and waved to it. He was picked up in a boat sent by the captain and taken to the ship. The sailors were very kind and helpful and did not take any payment from him for helping him. Sailing with them, Sinbad purchased goods and traded at the ports and the towns till they reached Baghdad. Sinbad's family and his friends were so happy that they celebrated his return. The Envious Man In a small town a long time ago, there lived two neighbors. One of them envied the other very deeply. The man who was envied decided to shift to a different town to avoid the envious man. So outside the capital of the kingdom, he found a small house with a well in the courtyard and a garden. He became a saintly man, a dervish, and gave the rooms of his house to other dervishes to live there. His goodness spread to everyone and he became famous. People came to visit the holy man and seek his prayers and blessings. One day, his old neighbor heard of him and hated him even more for his popularity and goodness. He went to the dervish who treated him with kindness and courtesy. The envious man asked him to walk out with him and leading him to the well, he pushed him in to kill him. Inside the well, the dervish who was pushed into the well did not die. The well itself was a magical place in which jinns and fairies lived. 
when he recovered from the shock of falling the dervish heard them talking to one another and could understand them one of them said this is a very good and holy man who came to live here to get away from his envious neighbor but the man followed him and pushed him into this well but tomorrow the sultan is coming to meet him said another he wants a cure for the princess who has been put under a spell by the genie maimoun how can she be cured asked another the dervish has a black cat with a white tip on her tail said the other if seven hairs from the tail are burnt and the perfume of the smoke is applied to the princess's head she will be well the princess is cured the dervish found footholds and climbed out of the well the other holy men were delighted to see him back even the black cat came to rub her against his leg he pulled seven white hairs out of her tail and kept them when the sultan visited him the next day he asked for the princess to be brought there when she came he lit a brazier and placed the seven hairs on the coal he allowed the fragrant smoke to circle her head her veil dropped and there was a loud cry the princess who seemed to have been unconscious suddenly woke up the cry came from the genie maimoun whose spell had been broken the sultan was delighted to see his beloved daughter cured and gave rich gifts to the dervish and his disciples he also declared that the princess would marry the dervish the just sultan sometime later the wazir died and the sultan appointed the dervish in his palace the dervish was the son-in-law of the sultan who had no sons therefore when the sultan died later the ministers the soldiers and the citizens were very happy to have the dervish as the new sultan one day as the sultan rode through the city crowd gathered to cheer him he saw the envious man in the crowd and sent one of the soldiers to fetch him the new sultan told his wazir give this man a thousand gold coins and from my own store give him 20 wagons full of merchandise then send a troop of soldiers to escort him to his home the envious man was amazed at the generosity of the sultan and bowed to him humbly everyone praised the sultan for his great mercy and nobility towards the man who tried to kill him Shehbaz's inheritance in Baghdad Shehbaz inherited as much wealth as his brothers but he did not use it wisely he was very polite and well behaved and knew how to please people but he wasted the money and had to beg for food and money he thought it would serve his purpose if he made friends with servants of rich people then he would get some money from them He saw a mansion where a rich Barmecide lived. Barmecide was said to be generous, so he asked the servant at the gate for some alms. The servant told him to go in and ask the master. Shehbaz walked through many richly furnished rooms till he reached the one in which sat an old man with a flowing white beard. He welcomed Shehbaz. politely and asked him why he had come shehbaz told him that he hoped to receive some alms from him for he was very poor and lived by begging the imaginary feast the old man sat up and said you are poor in baghdad i must help you He pretended to wash his hands, rubbing them together, and said, "Wash your hands too." Shehbaz imitated him, rubbing his hands as if washing them. 
Then he called to an imaginary servant to fetch food. No servant or food arrived, but the Burmecide acted as if there were tasty dishes on the table, and he served and ate them with relish. Thoroughly puzzled, Shehbaz again imitated him, appreciating and eating the food that was not there. The Burmecide even gave him an imaginary glass of wine, which Shehbaz pretended to drink and enjoy. In fact, he acted as if he was drunk and thumped the bombsite on his back. He apologized immediately, saying, It's because of the wine that I am drunk. The bombsite burst out laughing at Shehbaz's cleverness. The new friend, the Burmeside said, I have always wanted a friend who understood my sense of humor. Now I have found one. He called his servant and asked him to serve a lavish feast, a real one. Music was played while he ate. After that, he gave Shehbaz some of his own robes to wear. Shehbaz was surely treated like a dear friend and stayed on in the house of the Burmeside. Shehbaz was trusted to look after his house and all his business matters. He too served the Burmeside faithfully and became worthy of his trust. Twenty years passed and the Burmeside, growing old, died. He had no family or children, so his property was taken over by the king and once again Shehbaz found himself homeless on the streets. He did not want to go back to begging, so he joined a caravan that was going to Mecca. To Baghdad, the caravan that Shehbaz joined had to cover a long route, often through deserts to reach Mecca. The journey had many dangers. Apart from the difficulty of travelling in the heart of the desert, unfortunately, the caravan met with one of the dangers on the way. Bedouin tribesmen roamed the desert and attacked the pilgrims after holding them to ransom. They attacked the caravan and imprisoned Shehbaz, hoping to get some ransom in exchange for him. They tortured him to find out more about him. But soon they learned that he had nothing and no relatives who would pay a single coin for him. They were so disgusted that they put him on a camel and left him on top of a barren mountain to fend for himself as best as he could. Poor Shehbaz would have died if a caravan had not passed that way and carried him to Baghdad. The Ungrateful Snake A traveller on a camel, passing through a thorny forest, saw that an old campfire had caused a forest fire. A large snake was caught in the fire and was crying out for help. The compassionate traveller took a saddlebag from a camel's back and opening its mouth, he fixed a spear into it and extended it to the snake. The snake slid over the spear into the bag safely. The traveller opened the mouth of the bag to release the snake and told it to go away. But the ungrateful snake said it would harm both him and his camel. The traveller was shocked and asked, Why should you repay my kindness by killing me? Doing a good deed for someone unworthy is as bad as an evil deed against a good person said the snake. Who told you to return evil for good? asked the traveller. I learnt that from humans only, replied the snake. The Cow's Opinion We should not decide this only on your opinion, said the traveller. Let us ask some witnesses first. The snake agreed and seeing a cow grazing there, they went to ask her, What should be the return for someone giving us the benefit? 
आस्तस ने ह्यूमन बीइंग्स ऑलवेज पे बैक गुड विद इवन सेड द काउ आई सर्व्ड टू फार्मर लॉयली ऑल माय लाइफ गिविंग हिम काउस मिल्क एंड बटर फॉर हिज चिल्ड्रन एंड व्हेन आई ग्रो ओल्ड द फार्मर अनकेयरिंगली थ्रू मी आउट ऑफ द शेड एंड सेंट मी ऑफ टू ग्रेज इन द फॉरेस्ट नाउ when i'm fat and content in my old age he brought a butcher here to see me and sold me to him tomorrow he will kill me you have heard the cow said the snake i think i should kill you now wait said the traveler let us ask one more witness The trees have roots. Seeing a bare twisted tree, they asked it how a good deed should be repaid. Do what human beings do, said the tree sadly. Look at me. I used to be full of leaves and fruits. I gave shade to travelers and fruits to tired people. But they cut my twigs to make arrows. They chopped off my branches to make a plow. and my trunk has been chopped again and again to give them blanks in return for my kindness in giving them shade and rest they tore me down and injured me so much now you know how humans repay goodness said the snake i must do the same please let us ask just one more witness pleaded the traveler i want to live my life peacefully and have done you no harm the snake finally agreed to ask for last witness the fox is justice a fox had been watching everything from among the bushes and he came out he said to the traveler the return for good is always evil don't you know that but what good have you done to the snake for him to retaliate like this The traveler told the fox about how he saved the snake from the fire. "You are telling lies," said the fox. "No, he is speaking the truth," said the snake. "That is the bag. But how can an enormous snake like you get into a little bag like that?" asked the surprised fox. "I'll show you," said the snake, and he slithered into the bag. "Young man, You must not show mercy to the unworthy enemy," said the fox. Immediately, the traveler understood what he meant. He shut the bag and threw it on a stone, killing the evil snake. He had learned the lesson of good and evil. Sinbad's fifth voyage. Sinbad built his own ship and invited merchants from other countries on his next voyage. Then they set sail, trading along the way for many weeks till they arrived at an island that seemed deserted. They came upon a rock sick about to hatch. The merchants would not listen to Sinbad who told them to leave the egg alone. They broke it, killed the baby rock and ate it after roasting it. Suddenly The sky was overcast as two huge rocks, the parents of baby rock, grief-stricken and furious, swooped down on the merchants. The merchants ran for their lives, scrambling into their ship as the rocks attacked. But the rocks chased them, circling the ship, carrying huge rocks in their claws. One of the rocks dropped into the sea, but the next one smashed the ship. into smithereens small pieces flinging everyone overboard into the water sinbad lost sight of the others in trouble drifting along sinbad came to the rocky and steep shore of an island where he fell asleep on the soft lush grass fruit laden trees grew everywhere he later walked and land and found a frail old man sitting on a river bank unable to talk the man signaled to simbad to help him cross the river 
because he wanted to eat the delicious looking fruits there. Sinbad, being a kind person and feeling sorry for the old man, carried him on his back across the river. But the old man wouldn't get off his back. He gripped him with arms and legs wrapped tightly around him. Sinbad fainted, exhausted with the weight, but he found the old man still clutching him when he came around, holding on to him even when he plucked and ate fruit and lay down to rest. Sinbad wondered how to get rid of this old fellow for he was tired. The Old Man of the Sea Sinbad couldn't get rid of the old man for days. He racked his brains to think of some way to get him off. Suddenly he saw grapes. He picked them and made wine in the hollow shell of a fruit. Some days later, with the old man still hanging on to him, Sinbad began to sip the wine and began to sing and dance. The old man was curious about the drink and gulped some. He got drunk and his grip became loose. Sinbad was waiting for this and in a flash, he dropped the old man and ran away to the seashore. Luckily, he met some sailors who heard his story and explained to him. You are truly fortunate. This is the old man of the sea who strangles anyone he catches. Sinbad sailed away with them, reaching a town that seemed to have a place for strangers to stay. The Coconut Merchant In the morning, one of the friendly merchants gave Sinbad a sack and said, Go along with the others and just do what they are doing. He went along to a large grove of coconut trees with monkeys pounding on all of them. At first, he was puzzled when he saw the merchants throwing stones at them. Then he laughed for the monkeys began to imitate them. Not having stones, they flung coconuts at the merchants who quickly filled their sacks. Sinbad joined the fun and soon had a sack full of coconuts that he sold, soon becoming very rich. He met the captain of a trading ship that had just come there. The captain took him on board. So Sinbad wished his friends farewell and with a large cargo of coconuts sailed homewards. They stopped at an island and collected pepper and pearls and with trade in such merchandise, they reached Baghdad as very rich men. The Strange Mansion A humble porter lived in Baghdad. He sat every morning in the market with his large basket ready to be hired for work. One day, a veiled lady asked him to follow her to the shops. She bought many things, a jar of wine, meats, breads, fruits, vegetables, flowers, spices and perfumes. Carrying the heavy load, they came to a mansion and the door was opened by a very beautiful woman. Inside, in a large courtyard, lavishly furnished, sat a woman on a throne even more beautiful than the other two. They were three sisters, Zubeda on the throne, Sadia who opened the door and Amina who bought everything. They gave a lot of money to the porter and asked to stay and rest and eat. So, he was given a splendid meal and allowed to rest. They only insisted that he might talk and sing, but he mustn't ask questions. Visitors to the Mansion That night, as the porter sat enjoying the hospitality of the ladies, three strangers who were wandering dervishes arrived in the city. They heard the music and asked for shelter for the night there. The kind ladies allowed them to stay there and gave them a meal. While they ate, there was a knock at the door. Caliph Harun al-Rashid used to walk through the city with his wazir and an attendant 
all disguised as ordinary citizens. Hearing the beautiful music from the mansion, he knocked at the door. We are merchants who have just arrived, said the wazir, and we have no place to stay. May we spend some time resting here? They too were treated with courtesy and hospitality. There was only one condition. No one must ask any questions. The dervishes told the stories of the adventures and then, in the morning, all the guests departed, still wondering about the mansion. The Poor Man's Dream In Baghdad, there lived a very poor man. He struggled to make both ends meet by working as a porter or a laborer whenever he could, returning to his house completely exhausted. One night, he fell asleep as usual but was troubled by dreams. In the dream, an old man appeared and said, What are you doing in Baghdad? You should go to Cairo to seek your fortune. The man awoke and went about his work as usual. But all day, the dream kept coming to his mind. After a few days, he thought he should follow the advice of the old man in his dream. He decided to go to Cairo to seek his fortune. He closed his house and left for Cairo, travelling over land and the sea, reaching the place rather late at night. He knew no one in Cairo and found no inn, so he found shelter in a mosque and fell asleep there. The Fortune That night, a band of robbers entered the mosque and climbed over the wall into the neighboring house to stay. However, the people living there woke up and raised a hue and cry. The robbers ran for their lives. The police arrived but found only the traveler sleeping in the mosque. They arrested the stranger and thrashed him, thinking he was in league with the robbers. For three days, he was put into a prison before being hauled before the chief of police. On being questioned, he told him about his dream and how he came from Baghdad to seek his fortune. The police chief laughed, you silly fellow. I have dreamt of a house in Baghdad with a hidden treasure under a fountain. But I didn't go there to find it. It's just a dream. The poor man returned to Baghdad, realizing that the house was his own. Digging under the fountain, he found his fortune. Aladdin and the Evil Sorcerer When Mustafa, a poor tailor, died, his wife was left to care for her lazy son, Aladdin. He did nothing but play in the streets. A stranger watched him and one day, posing as Aladdin's uncle, he wept and hugged him and gave him costly gifts. Aladdin and his mother were puzzled, for they had never heard of his uncle. The man was actually an evil sorcerer from Africa. He took Aladdin to a mountain where he lit a fire and threw magic powder into it. A large stone door with a ring on it came out and the sorcerer made Aladdin open it. He told him to go down passed three rooms and fetched him an old lamp from the garden. But when Aladdin returned with the lamp and asked his uncle to pull him out before giving it to him, the sorcerer was furious. He pushed the stone, shutting Aladdin in the pit. The Magical Lamp Aladdin wept and prayed in the dark till he accidentally rubbed the lamp. Smoke filled the pit and a figure arose, saying, I am here to serve you, master, for you own the lamp. The genie helped Aladdin escape from there and go home. After he had told his mother everything, the genie laid out a feast. Soon they became prosperous. One day, Aladdin saw the Sultan's beautiful daughter and he fell in love with her. 
he sent his mother with jewels to the sultan to seek his daughter's hand in marriage. She did as he asked. The sultan consulted his wazir, who wanted his own son to marry the princess. He advised the sultan to wait for three months. The sultan, according to his wazir's advice, asked the woman to wait for three months and then tell him if her son still wished to marry the princess. The Sultan's Deception Before three months were over, however, the wazir's son married the princess. Aladdin was angry at the deception. He asked the genie to fetch the princess and her bridegroom that night. Aladdin sent the bridegroom out into the cold while he told the princess about the deception. At dawn, he sent them back but repeated this the next night. They told the Sultan but the Wazir's son wanted to go back home. Once again, the Sultan sought the Wazir's advice and demanded jewels from Aladdin carried by 80 servants for his daughter. With the genie's help, Aladdin sent them to the Sultan. Then he rode down the streets, richly dressed and throwing gold coins to the people. The Sultan gave his daughter in marriage to Aladdin, who had a splendid golden palace inlaid with gems. Soon everyone grew to love and respect him and he became the commander of the Sultan's army. The Sorcerer Returns The sorcerer had learnt of Aladdin's escape and that he was now rich and married to the princess. He returned in disguise as an old merchant, exchanging new lamps for the old ones. Aladdin's wife, who didn't know about the magical lamp, exchanged it for a new one. The sorcerer used the genie to transport the princess and the palace to Africa. The sultan was furious at finding his daughter missing and the palace gone. He was stopped from punishing Aladdin by the people who loved him. Aladdin prayed to the genie with his magical ring and reached his wife. She was very happy and told him that the lamp was hidden in the sorcerer's room. Aladdin told her how to trick the sorcerer so that she might kill him. Then, taking the lamp with its genie, he returned home with his wife and the palace where they lived happily ever after. The Three Sisters Khusro Shah came to the throne and went in disguise with his wazir around his kingdom to see if all was well. One day, he overheard three sisters chatting about the person each one of them wished to marry. The eldest said, that she wished to marry the sultan's baker. I wish to marry the chief cook of the sultan, said the second one. The youngest sister laughed and said, I will marry the sultan. The sultan smiled at his wazir and said, Bring them to the court tomorrow. The wazir summoned the sisters to the court. I heard what you were discussing last night, said the sultan. What you wish for shall come true. The girls were frightened and tried to get out of the situation by saying they were simply joking about it. But the Sultan married the youngest sister and got the other two married to the royal baker and the chief cook respectively. Jealousy Begins The wedding of the youngest sister to the Sultan was splendid while the weddings of the sisters to the royal baker and the chief cook respectively were according to their capacity. This began to rankle in the hearts of the two sisters. When they met later at the hammam or public bath, they complained to each other. What is special about her that she should be the sultana? Either of us could have married the sultan. They said to each other, the jealousy grew more every day till they decided 
that they must take revenge. The two sisters were looking for a way to harm the Sultana. They got the opportunity when a baby was born to her. They put the boy into a cradle and floated it down the canal in the palace garden. They told the Sultan that their sister gave birth to a puppy and he flew into a rage. The Sultana punished. The royal gardener saw the baby in the cradle and took him home to his wife. They were delighted to adopt the baby as their son as they were childless. The next year again, the sisters did the same thing when the second son and a daughter were born to Sultana. The Sultan was furious and ordered that the Sultana be executed. But the wazir and the courtiers loved the gentle and kind Sultan. They begged to Sultan to exile her forever instead of executing her. The Sultan agreed but said a box should be built for her outside a mosque. She would stay there wearing rough clothes and with no comforts and the people entering the mosque would spit at her through the window. The envious sisters were delighted to see their sister so humiliated. But she bore her punishment with such dignity that people began to feel pity for her. The Royal Children The royal gardener named the children Behman, Parvez and Parizan. They were beautiful and graceful. He brought them up to know all the arts and skills of children in noble families. Reading, writing, knowledge of the world, music, riding and the skill in the use of weapons. The royal gardener bought a large farm outside the city where they grew up to be fine young people. He stopped working at the palace gardens for he had grown old. For many years, the old man lived happily with his children. But he and his wife died without telling them the truth about how he found them. They had many adventures and one day when they rode into the city, people stopped to stare at the young men who looked so much like the Sultan. The secret was finally known when their cradles were found. The angry Sultan punished the jealous sisters and brought the gentle Sultana home. Sinbad's Sixth Voyage Sinbad decided to travel over land routes to a port in India and then sail from there. It was a very safe and useful journey and he and his friends traded well along the way. The ship sailed from an Indian port and kept going well till a storm came up, carrying it off its course. The worried captain looked at maps and see for this dangerous sea could destroy them. The ship crashed into a mountain rising steeply out of the sea and broke. They lost everything but were glad to be alive. They found the wreckage of many ships and skeletons of dead sailors. None seemed to have left safely from here. Sinbad noticed that a river was flowing not into the sea but into an arch in the rocks. Following it, he reached a cavern inside the arch with walls and floor covered with diamonds and other precious stones. Down the river The food didn't last for long, so the sailors began dying of starvation one after another. Sinbad thought he was going to die in any case and decided to make an attempt to find a way out. He made a raft and with his small amount of food sailed down the river gathering up precious stones. The raft floated down the tunnel for many days with Sinbad hardly eating anything. He slept for he was tired. 
He awoke to find the raft tight and men with dark faces chatting around him. He couldn't understand them. But when he bowed and spoke in Arabic, one of them understood him. Sinbad asked for some food and they put him on a horse and took him and his raft to the king of the Indies in the city of Serendip. Sinbad introduced himself to the king politely and asked for food and shelter. A rare kingdom. The king treated Sinbad with great courtesy, listening attentively to his story and seeing the raft too. He ordered that the story be written down in golden letters and displayed as part of the history of the kingdom. Sinbad was stunned when he saw the king's treasury, for he had never seen such wealth. The king offered anything he wished to have, but Sinbad asked for nothing. Therefore, the king himself presented many costly gifts to Sinbad. It was a beautiful and fascinating kingdom. Sinbad saw with days and nights of equal length. It had a beautiful valley on top of the highest mountain in the world. Precious gems were found everywhere as were rare plants and trees. The sea gave pearls and the valleys gave diamonds. The king rode on a royal decorated elephant and he ensured that his people were treated in a fair and just manner. A Royal Farewell When Sinbad wished to return home, the king gave him a special ship and many rich gifts. He sent a message for the Caliph of Baghdad with gifts for him too, including a ruby vase filled with pearls and a snake skin that could protect and cure anyone who slept on it. Sinbad returned home in comfort, going first to the Caliph's palace to present him the gifts sent by the king of the Indies. The Caliph was touched and impressed and heard all that Sinbad told him about the splendor of the king and his kingdom. He listened to the adventures Sinbad had and great danger he had passed through. He too was very gracious and gave Sinbad many gifts. Sinbad came home rich and satisfied to his family and friends who were happy to see him safely back and to hear of his adventures. The Adventures of Akib When Akib came to the throne, he went all over his kingdom and then decided to visit the islands around so that he might meet all his subjects. Having been over all his own islands, he set off to explore further lands in a fleet of ships. Things went peacefully for 40 days and then a terrible storm threw them off course. The captain had no idea where they were. But suddenly he saw a black island looming ahead and gave a shout. We are lost. He explained that ahead lay the black mountain. It was like a magnet and drew out all the iron and nails on a ship till it broke and sank. There is a brass horse at the peak with a rider who wears a leaden breastplate. He went on. It has strange writing on it and as long as it stays there, no ship is safe. The Brass Horseman Akib watched in horror as the ship was drawn to the mountain and saw the iron and the nails flying out towards it. The ship crashed against the rocks and broke into bits. Akib held on to a broken plank and reached the shore safely. Everyone else was drowned. He reached the mountain top and was so tired that he fell asleep. An old man appeared in a stream and said, when you wake up, dig here. 
you will find a brass bow and arrows with which you must shoot the horseman. The horse will fall down dead. Bury him and you will find that the mountain vanishes into the sea. A boat will appear with a brass boatman. Go home in that but do not speak on the way. Everything happened exactly like his dream. But as he was reaching home, Akib cried out, Thank heavens! The boat vanished and he fell into the sea. An unfortunate accident. Akib reached a shore and dried himself out when he saw some sailors bringing a young boy ashore. He was taken to an underground cave and lived there while they returned. Akib opened the door and made friends with the boy who said he had been hidden here because it was said that a man named Akib would kill him. So without telling him his name, Akib looked after him. Unfortunately, when he fetched a melon and wished to cut it with a knife, he slipped and fell on the boy, killing him. When the sailors returned, they found the boy dead and his father fell down unconscious. Akib hid himself for he knew they would not believe him. He saw them bury the boy and take the father away. He could only wait for the next ship. When it came, Akib thought he would reach home safely. The Golden Door Akib was carried away by a huge rock to an island and dropped there. He saw a castle and entering it, he found 40 young ladies there in a large chamber with a hundred toes all made of fine wood except one golden door. The young ladies gave him food and clothes and he rested. They told him he could go into any room except the one with the golden door. He stayed for 40 days during which he went into all the rooms. After the ladies had left, he became curious about the golden door and opened it. He saw a magnificent black horse standing in a beautiful garden. Unable to stop himself, he mounted the horse but it leapt high into the air and flicked its tail, blinding his right eye. Then he ran out to the seashore to wait for a ship. As soon as one arrived, he caught a boat and went home. The three princes, Hussein, Ali and Haman were the sons of the Sultan who also had a beautiful niece, Noor un Nihar, an orphan whom the Sultan brought up. The three princes loved Noor but the Sultan didn't want them to marry her for fear that they would quarrel. But when the princes asked him to decide which of them she should marry, he gave them a task. Travel to different kingdoms, said the Sultan. Bring back the most extraordinary thing you find as a gift for me and then I will decide. The princes, disguised as merchants, promised to meet after one year at an inn on the outskirts of the city. Hussein went to Bisnagur, an Indian port famed for rich merchandise. A merchant was selling a carpet for 30 bags of gold. It's a magic carpet, said the merchant. Sit on it and it will fly you wherever you wish to go. Hussein had found a gift. The Ivory Eyeglass Ali, the second brother, went to Shiraz, the capital of Persia, with a caravan. He posed as a jeweler from India, for Shiraz was famed for gold, silver, precious stones and many other items. He found a vendor trying to sell a tube made of ivory with a glass at each end and was curious to know about it. It cost 30 bags of gold. What's special about it? asked Ali. Here, see for yourself, said the vendor. 
Ali put the tube at one eye and peered into it. He saw his father, the Sultan, and then he saw Noor. The vendor smiled. It's very costly because when you look through that eyeglass, you will be able to see whatever you wish to see. Ali thought this was a very rare and extraordinary article, and truly worthy to carry home as a gift for his father. So he paid thirty bags of gold and bought it. The third gift. Ahmed reached Samarkand, and there he found a hawker selling an apple in the market for thirty-five bags of gold. He wondered aloud why the apple should be so costly, and the hawker said, "It is magical, sir. Just smelling its fragrance." Can cure the illness even of a dying person. So Ahmed bought it as a gift for his father. After a year, they all met at the inn and showed each other their special gifts. But Hussain suddenly exclaimed, looking through the eyeglass, "Noor is ill. She is dying." The brothers sat on the magical carpet and were immediately transported to their father's palace. Noor was indeed ill. Ahmed offered the fragrant apple, and she revived suddenly. Now it was a problem for the Sultan to decide the best gift. The eyeglass showed Noor to be ill. The carpet brought them home at once, and the apple revived her. The winner. The Sultan had to find some way to decide. Which of his sons should marry Noor? So he took them to a large field outside the city to hold a shooting contest using their bows and arrows. Whoever shoots the arrow the farthest shall win Noor's hand in marriage, declared the Sultan. Hussain shot first, and it went far away to hit a tree. Ali's arrow went even further and buried itself on a tree trunk beyond Hussain's tree. Ahmed shot the next arrow, and it vanished completely. No one could find it. The Sultan decided that since the arrow was missing, Ahmed could not be considered the winner. Ali's arrow had been shot a greater distance away. Therefore, Noor's hand was given in marriage to him. They lived happily there, while Ahmed left to search for the lost arrow. Hussain became a disciple to a holy man. For the rest of his life. Sinbad's seventh voyage. The Caliph of Baghdad had a task for Sinbad to perform, so he sent for him one day. The King of the Indies had sent him lavish gifts, and he wished to reply with equal courtesy to that gesture. So reluctantly, Sinbad went to the Caliph's court to receive his orders. The Caliph gave him a luxurious ship for his journey to the King of the Indies, who welcomed him joyously. Among the gifts sent by the Caliph was a bed with golden curtains, another with red velvet, and many more beds of different designs, richly embroidered robes, and those made of the finest white linen from Egypt. There were beautifully crafted statues and priceless tables that were said to have belonged. To the king Solomon, the caliph thanked the king for his friendship and courtesy. The gifts pleased the king so much that he presented many more to Sinbad for him and for the caliph. Troubles not over. The return journey would have been fine if the ship had not been attacked by pirates who killed or imprisoned everyone on board. Among those imprisoned was Sinbad, from whom, like everyone else, everything was taken away. The prisoners were given dirty cloaks and sold as slaves on an island. Sinbad's master was rich, but kind merchant who gave him clean clothes and food. Sinbad told him about his own past as a rich merchant when his new master asked him. The merchant wanted to know if Sinbad could shoot. With a bow and arrows, perhaps," said Sinbad. 
I will learn to become an expert. The merchant led Sinbad into the forest and left him there with a strange instruction. Elephants will come in herds. When you kill one, come and tell me. He gave Sinbad a bow and arrows and some food before returning to the city. Ivory Hill Sinbad sat on a tree which shook as the herd approached. Fortunately, he shot down one elephant while the herd withdrew in disorder. Sinbad told his master and brought him back. They buried the dead elephant. When he became a skeleton, they would remove his tusks for the ivory. For two months, Sinbad continued to kill one elephant and bury it. But one morning, the furious herd shook Sinbad out of the tree and carried him deep into the forest. Terrified, he saw that they had brought him to what was the burial ground of the elephants. The skeletons and bones were a tragic reminder of the damage done to them by the killing. They did not harm him but just left him there. Their nobility moved him deeply and he realized what wise and gentle creatures the elephants were. Returning to his master, he told him about the burial ground on the ivory hill. Sinbad returns home. Sinbad's understanding and pity for the great creatures touched his master so much that he set him free to return to his home. He stayed till the monsoon began in order to help the merchant get the ivory which was enough to fill all the warehouses. The merchant put sufficient things in the ship to make Sinbad's journey home comfortable and gave him ivory and gifts. Sinbad left the ship at the next port where he sold the ivory for gold and then joined a caravan for the road back home. Arriving in Baghdad, he first presented himself in the court and reported that he had completed his task. Then he returned to stay among his family and friends and to share with them all the stories of his adventures, of the places and people and customs he had seen. He had earned his wealth and his rest by facing all the dangers of his life. Prince Kamar and Princess Badora Near the coast of Persia was an island ruled by King Shah Zaman. He had a son named Kumar Ul Zaman. When he was 15, the king told him to select a bride, but the prince refused to marry. The king was angry and imprisoned him in a castle tower. The castle was inhabited by a female genie, Maimun. She was surprised to see the handsome prince imprisoned. One night, she met another genie, Dinash, who told her about a beautiful princess of China. They argued over who was more beautiful. To compare them, Dinash brought the sleeping princess Badora to the prince's chamber. It was impossible to know who was better looking. They woke the two up in turn so that they themselves might decide. Kamar fell in love with the sleeping princess and put his ring on her finger, taking hers. The princess also fell in love with him. The genies put them back to sleep and Dinash quickly carried her back to her father's palace in China. No one believes. The princess missed the handsome prince and no one believed her when she told them about meeting him. Her nurse's son, much the one who was like a brother, was the only one who believed her and set off to find the unknown prince. Meanwhile, the prince too had missed the beautiful princess and fallen ill. He was moved to another mansion on an island. Marzawan travelled from one country to another. Finally, he reached the island where Kamar lived. He met Kamar and told him about Princess Badora and wished to take him there. Pretending to go hunting, Marzawan made out that Kamar died in a hunting accident. He took him to China to meet the princess. The prince was disguised as an astrologer. He secretly showed the ring to Badora who was happy to see him. Then Kamar 
introduced himself as the son of King Shah Zaman to the princess's father. They were married in a splendid ceremony. Seeking the talisman, Kamar wished to take her home to his father and the king agreed. Prince Kamar and Princess Badora traveled for many days. One night when she was fast asleep, Kamar took out a talisman tied at her girdle. Suddenly, a large bird swooped down and snatching the talisman, it flew away. He ran after the bird, chasing it for days till he lost it in a town by the sea. He met a gardener and started working as his assistant. Princess Badora awoke to find her talisman and her husband missing. She disguised herself as Prince Kamar and went to Ebony Island. King Armanos offered the hand of his daughter Hayat al Nafus to the prince. Princess Badora told her the truth. They both decided to keep the secret. Kamar was living with the gardener. One day, he found the talisman of his princess. A few days later, when Kamar cut down a dead tree, he found a buried treasure. The Prince at Ebony Island Meanwhile, the gardener had discovered that a ship was sailing in three days to Ebony Island. Kamar filled the treasure in 50 jars and covered them with olives. He hid the talisman in one of them. Kamar gave them to the captain of the ship and said, I will follow in a while. But Kamar missed the ship. Princess Badora had been watching the ships come in, waiting for news of her husband. When she saw the ship, she ran out to check. She bought all the olives and found her talisman. She called the captain of the ship and asked him to fetch the merchant whose jars they were. Kamar was brought to Ebony Island. Princess Fedora, still in disguise, treated him like a prince. The next morning, she revealed her true identity. Kamar was delighted to see her. She told King Armanos everything and introduced the real Prince Kamar to him. Hayat became Kamar's second wife and they all lived happily. Blind Baba Abdullah Caliph Harun al Rashid saw the old blind beggar on the street and stopped to ask him how he lost his sight. The man was named Baba Abdullah. The old man said he had been orphaned when he was very young, but slowly he began to learn to trade and soon became the owner of 80 camels. He lived in Baghdad and one day he had taken merchandise to India. Returning to Balasore, he stopped to graze the camels. Just then, a dervish who was also on his way to Balasore came and sat beside him. Abdullah shared his meal with the dervish. Then he told Abdullah about a vast amount of treasure not far away. Abdullah was eager to find it. The dervish led him to it and Abdullah's eyes were dazzled. He and the dervish collected gold and jewels and he saw the dervish putting a small box into his robes. Blind Greed Abdullah loaded the 80 camels and gave 40 camels to the dervish. Abdullah turned towards Baghdad and the dervish went towards camels. But then Abdullah was overcome by blind greed. He argued that a dervish had no need for treasure or camels. He was a saintly man who would give everything away whereas they would be useful for Abdullah. He persuaded the dervish to return all the camels. Then he asked for the box. Reluctantly, the dervish gave it, saying, It has an ointment which applied to the left eye will show you where treasures are. But if applied to the right eye, you will be blinded. Abdullah tried it on the left eye and saw the treasure. Then he applied it to the right eye and became blind. The camels and treasure were useless and he gave them to the dervish. 
Since then, he had become a beggar in Baghdad. The compassionate caliph gave him enough to live comfortably. Thanks for watching. Do like, share, subscribe to Sahil Book House.